And we've seen this uh, in our intro, in our uh, study of the first chapter, and you'll, we'll see this more and more as we move into the, the meat of, the, of this book. But Paul is not mincing words. Even from the first chapter, he starts with addressing the issue of unity. And we discussed last Sunday, so I mean, and this Friday as well was in our small group about what does it mean to, to build bridges and to not build walls? How does it mean to fight against pride in the church and to maintain our unity together? Because the devil is shrewd. He will use anything to make us feel proud or to say, I'm better than you are. And Paul addresses that in a way that builds the church and builds unity. And we're moving into chapter two today. And this is basically a simplified version of the whole chapter, a message and a mystery. It's nothing more than this. It's if I were to just give you two words to retain, to remember, it's this. We have a message about a mystery. And the mystery is no longer that much of mystery if you have the spirit of God, because God's spirit has made that mystery actually known to those who love God. But we do have to clarify this issue of, of the message first. So let me ask you this question. What do people like nowadays? Give me some, just throw some, some, some ideas. What people like nowadays? Oh, Rudy is being very, very godly this morning. Yes, people do like themselves a lot more nowadays than uh, maybe in the past. Although that's a pretty human trait from Adam here. So yeah, love themselves. What else? Freedom. Freedom, and especially freedom in the absence of consequences. People want freedom, but also freedom from consequences. But as someone used, uh, said once uh, very wisely, you can choose anything in your life except one thing. You cannot choose the consequences. But yes, freedom is something people desire nowadays. One more. We have time. It's only 3.10. Entertainment, yes. People want to feel entertained. It is our culture, especially, like I would say, probably mid-60s, this began to be prevalent in the West, but East, the same, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, the same. I, I mean, I know Romania also wanted, desired entertainment. You know, I can only think of, of the gladiators saying, you know, shouting out, are you entertained, you know? It's exactly. So we ask this question, what do people like nowadays? And the dangerous question is this, am I going to adapt or change my message to fit what people expect, what people desire? There's some cultural trends that have hit the church, especially probably since, I'd say again, uh, uh, mid-60s. And some of them have left an impact, some of them good, some of them not so good. And there are things that came and, and went. Like I was back in the, I would say, early 2000s, and I was part of a, of a ministry, not, not a church, but the, that ministry was plagued with the idea of sales techniques. You know, they're trying to, uh, to bring message, the message and to bring in money for the message, which is not an idea in, in itself a bad idea. But all they used was sales techniques and just didn't feel right. Or, of course, music styles. You know, Pastor Steve, how many worship wars have you fought? Don't answer. You know, if you don't know what a worship war is, it's when uh, somebody has a different preference in style of music and they insist on that, that that is the best, the most, the whatever, you know, and they, we become proud and selfish. Those worship wars were not a good sign for the church. Or, you know, this part of what I studied now for school, um, the, the use of psychiatry. Am I saying great psychiatry? Um, in, in churches, when people began to analyze and, and uh, just for, you know, look at the people's uh, how say, human's mind, which is not bad. It's a good thing to learn how the mind works. Don't get me wrong. But they overemphasized that in the, to the detriment of the work of the Spirit of God and the nature of the human heart, essentially. You know, I grew up in a country that said humans are essentially intrinsically good. It is the environment that makes them bad, which is a perversion of what the truth of the gospel is, which is, I am at my core an evil person, but for the grace of God. You know, and if I'm gonna end with this one, self-help, 12 steps to this, seven steps to that, three steps, and you know, there are some good books actually with those titles. I have a book in my office called The Seven Habits of a Highly, Su a highly Successful uh, Person. 
written by a very smart uh, Mormon guy. But, uh, and it's a good book. I, I really enjoyed that book. And it, I believe it's got good, um, good stuff in it. But when the prevalence is self-help, where is the emphasis on? Go on. Self, exactly, not God. We are trying to make ourselves better by techniques, but not by, uh, by you know, by actually obeying and learning, like Rudy has prayed, to grow in the Lord. And most of, most of these issues in the church, probably, probably, not all of them, probably they stem from the desire to succeed. Pastors like me and others and churches, we want to succeed. We want numbers. We want growth. It's not a bad thing if it replace, but only if it replaces the core of our mission, which is Jesus Christ, or the need for approval. The question of some pastors, especially younger ones, although I'm not Steve, I mean, Joe, sorry. Uh, well, I, Cause I loved your sermon, but everybody loved your sermon. You say just uh, um, very good job, Pastor Steve. I mean, Joe, uh, when people ask themselves, how, how should I make this message to receive as many applause as I can? as much approval as I can, to please as many people as I can. Why is, it, why is that question wrong? It's not bad to, to like to be liked. That's not that big of a... Okay, it's a sin, but it's... Okay, never mind. I'm going to dig a, a dig bigger hole here. Uh, why is that question bad? The focus is on men, on myself, on my success, on what I need or, or I think I need uh, for me to be a successful person. And these two tendencies to either succeed or to please people or to get approval, I would say, uh, have led to a constant temptation for people at the pulpit, but not only, everybody that has a message and everybody has a message, um, to compromise that Christian message so we can please as many people as possible. Again, I don't want to be insensitive and, and uh, create enemies just for the sake of, for the fun of it. Don't get me wrong. You know, and Anna hates this, but it's very much true of myself. And I'm Romanian, so I guess it not all of Romanians, but many of them are like this. We know we have feelings. We do know you have feelings. We just don't care. You know, and I don't want to be that guy. You know, I want to care about your feelings, but I want to care about the truth more. And this is, I'm going to say this once, and I'm going to, I'm not going to repeat it again. How many here are Canadians? Okay, I wasn't sure who, if you're Canadian or not. Cause I, so uh, almost everyone here is Canadian. What is the major uh, treat or trait? Trait, not treat. Trait of Canadians to be nice. nice. Exactly it's correct. It's in our DNA as Canadians. We are to be nice. It's not a bad thing. You know, go to Eastern Europe and see when people are not nice. It it's not fun. You know, but the problem is to be nice. You have to choose feelings over truth. You do appreciate truth, but if you want to be nice to the core, you got to put feelings above truth. And that's not good. Because we tend to compromise the truth, to hide the truth, to ignore the truth, so we can protect feelings. It's not, that's not good. Anyway, so the church is not meant to please people. Although, again, I'm not here to make enemies. Don't get me wrong. And as Paul David Tripp, one of the books I'm reading, two actually are by this guy, uh, we should seek to make converts. We should not seek compliments. We should seek converts, not compliments. And I, that kind of hit me hard uh, this week as I read this book. And uh, it's because we are not driven by the desire to have success. We are driven by God's grace, by the desire to see change of heart and change of lives. Because, you know, the same guy wrote these words, uh, Paul David Tripp, the central work of God's kingdom is change. When you become a Christian, when you enter God's kingdom, the major work that happens in you is transformation. You know, the same way that uh, Paul writes in first, sorry, Romans 12, be transformed. That's King James. You know, be transformed. I'm sure it's more modern translation. I just, that's how I learned it in King James. It stuck with my, my brain. Be transformed. By the renewal of our minds. And it's not, I'm going to change myself. That's not it. You know, it is a passive. We are subject to a transformation. You are being transformed by God's spirit. You know, that is the central work of God's kingdom. And that means we are changed by the work of the word of God and God's spirit in us. The word of God and the spirit of God 
produce change in us. And we, like Paul, have a message that is very important. And nothing should stop us from bringing, to the, bringing this message to people, and nothing should ten, tempt us to alter or modify it. So let's see what this message is. If your Bible's open, please read with me 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter, verses 1 through 5. When I, Paul, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Give you some context here. Uh, Paul just says uh, three times here that he did not come with lofty speech of wisdom or wisdom or wisdom. So I think twice more in this short passage. That this is, that does, does this mean that he, what's the word, washed down, watered, watered down his message? Dumb, does, dumbed down his message? No. If you read Paul's writing, it's pretty, I mean, it's, it takes some brains to understand. It, it, I think to write that stuff, you got to bring some wisdom. But what Paul says here, I have not used the, what you are used with as Greeks in Corinth, Greece, when it comes to wisdom. It's oratory, you know, that uh, the art of speech and the art of convincing someone with fancy words, that was big in Greece. And Paul said, I'm not using that. I'm not using oral techniques to, to uh, impress you with my words, to bring some magic of logic to you, not magic of logic, some science of logic to you and to convince you that way. No, I brought you something simple, something clear. Christ and been crucified. And I brought it not in the wisdom of this fancy proclamation. I brought it in the power of the Spirit, a demonstration of the Spirit and the power and of power. And so Paul himself it applies to that passage of last week when he says, God chose the weak. He says, I was weak. You know, verse 3 says, I came here in weakness and in fear and much trembling. You thought, you maybe think, what that, what that mean? Well, if you don't know, just go make a note now and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 at home to understand what kind of ministry Paul entertained. You know, we, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get some, uh, so, okay, go past, not future, but past. I was this summer up in Thunder Bay, you know, and um, I struggled with such a harsh environment and such a difficult trip. I mean, my 2018 Honda Corolla, I mean, Toyota Corolla, uh, run perfectly. I stopped every four hours for gas and a Gatorade. I slept at a, um, just this hotel. I mean, it was just, just a clean room and clean bed and just, oh. and then I went to this camp. It was so hard. I had three meals a day and snacks and a good bed and AC and, oh boy, I suffered. I mean, I'm not saying it was easy. You know, to drive 16 hours is not fun always. But you know what? When Paul suffered, let me actually, you know what? Let's, let's give, let me give you just a hint, a taste of what, what Paul sees as ministry. Far more imprisonments with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the 40 lashes of less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and uh, stoned as with stones, okay? Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, danger in the wilderness, dangers at sea, danger from the false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and continues. So you say, why did Paul write in weakness and trembling? Because ministry is not, as some people assume, just a fun walk with a Bible in your hand and just you get to throw verses here left and right. The devil is shrewd and active. But in the midst of those trials and tribulations, Paul had a message. 
Christ and nothing else. He pro proclaimed this testimony of, a, of, of God sending his son to die for our sins and said, this is the one message I want you to know, a clear message, and it relies not on your ability to make sense of it or my ability to be a very good um, speaker. It relies on the Spirit of God. Are you guys afraid or not afraid? That's not a good word. Are you guys hesitant to preach the gospel to people? Lift up your hand. If, you, if you're not so inclined or you're just, just a little hesitant or timid or shy or whatever, you know, you might, that, I think more of us probably are. So most of the time we think we're not prepared because we assume that the power of the message stands or, say, or relies on my ability to be convincing. It doesn't. The message is so simple that people call it a folly. The message is simple. We are sinful to our core. Christ has died as a solution for our problem. Receive it. It's there. It's for you to accept it. It won't be thrown, it won't be pushed down your throat. It's there for you to accept. It's simple. And because it's simple, people say, it's, what do I do for it? Nothing. Just believe. No, no, I have to do something. No, just, you know, so we have this assumption that we have to convince people. Just pray. Preach the gospel, simple gospel. You know, if you don't nothing more, if you don't nothing more, just go to that old song. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Such a deep truth, truth in such simple words. Anyway, oh, I have to do something about that watch. Okay, so Paul did not employ human techniques, although I believe he was an excellent public speaker because he wanted them to know the power of the gospel. That was his essence of his message. You know, there is power in the simple words, Christ and him crucified. But then continues, and he has, he tells them actually, you know what? There is wisdom. I'm gonna read just a couple of verses, not the whole passage. Um, Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Paul tells them, there is a wisdom that actually I bring to you. A wisdom, he says, although it is not a wisdom of, the, of this age, of the rules of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. In Greek, it says a mystery of God. Or maybe the older translation might use the same word, mystery. Which God, sorry, uh, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But it, as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his spirit. So Paul transitions here with that amazing one word, yet. You know, he says, he points that by that one word, yet, it shifts our attention to the fact that although he ignored the wisdom of this world, he is bringing the wisdom of God, which is, he says, it's not just mine, it's Mike's also, you know, it's Emily's, it's, it's, it's even Pastor Joe's, sorry, <laughs> it's all of us, you know, because it doesn't come of how much I study, although we do need to study, okay, do study the Bible, it comes from the Spirit of God, that reveals this truth to us. And there's a key here. Actually, I'm going ahead of my notes, but uh, it says this wisdom is, because, is for those who love him. It's verse nine. It was prepared for those who love him. In my notes, I have a phrase here, love trumps knowledge. And to us, maybe this is not important, but for the Greeks, so overwhelmed by what is called Gnostic beliefs, which Gnostic the Gnostics believe that there is this knowledge of the mind that is so transcendent that only special few have it. And knowledge is to be attained. Knowledge is to be pursued. Paul says, love trumps knowledge. Because if you love God, you get a wisdom that those guys will never have. Anyway, I said I got ahead of my, of my message here. So it says in that word yet, he transitions to the wisdom of God. And he, he has in this passage a couple of characters. I'm not sure if it's two or three, but I'm not going to go deeper into this because it's in the study for the small groups. It says he speaks to the mature. He brings this to the mature. He imparts wisdom to the mature. Also brings, it's not on the screen, it's in your Bibles. He speaks about the spiritual man. 
and the natural man. Those are the, the ones who are at odds in this, uh, in this, in this section. You know, the uh, spiritual man has, or person, not man, you know, I say man, you know, I mean, I'm in person. Okay, I'm going to use this word, has the mind of Christ. Just like in Philippians chapter 2, may the mind of Christ be in you, the same mind as of Christ. Or in Colossians, when Paul writes in Colossians 1, 9 through 11, that we can have that heart and mind and knowledge and wisdom of God. Anyway, so there's a spiritual man that knows and has the mind of God, and there's a natural person who doesn't get that. And the, fine, the thing is, the natural person is not less smart. We're not talking about, you know, so I'm not sure what good word it would be, dumb. Is a bad word, dumb? Uh, you know, less intelligent. We're not talking about less intelligent. We're talking about those who do not have the spirit. Therefore, they will never, ever make sense of the mysteries of God. And this is the, S, the, the main topic of this section, the first 16 through, uh, sorry, 6 through 16. There is a hidden secret wisdom of God or a mystery of the wisdom of God. What is that mystery? What was secret and hidden along the ages, but revealed now? Give me one word. Christ. Nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less. Christ was the mystery of God. When God says, you have a problem. He said, but it's been millennia since I've been working or planning, I would say, on this solution, which is Christ Jesus. You may struggle with your sins. You tried sacrifice. You tried maybe eat idols or whatever. But there is only one way, which is my son, Jesus Christ. That is the mystery. Christ embodies God's wisdom. And I love how he gives us this glimpse of the wisdom of God in verses 9 and 10 when he says, love beats knowledge. God has revealed this wisdom to all those that love him. Maybe that's why Paul writes that amazing passage of Philippians 3.8. And continues in 315, but eight is so powerful. Make a note. You, you, got, you guys get the bulletins? The last page is for notes, okay? Just, just, made, just saying. But Paul says this in Philippians 3.8, that all he wants is to know Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Do we do this? Do we count everything as loss? What was everything for Paul? His statute, stat, his, him being a Jew, him being a Pharisee, him being perfect by the law, as he says there. All those are filthy rags. I count them as nothing because I get to know Christ. What do we pursue in life? What is our message? It is not methods of being successful. It is not ways, seven steps to get you better. It is not self-help. It's not fight philosophy or psych psychiatry it is Christ Jesus. If a marriage has problems, if they get a good counselor by God's grace, the solution will be draw near to Christ. Let him transform you. As each spouse is changed, then marriages are, marriages are changed. You know, if you have issues at work or in the church here, if there are issues here, the solution is not, you know, the conflict management or whatever is conflict resolution. Or those kind of things. Although we probably need some of those skills, which I should say. But the solution is, is the same. Repent and put your faith and trust in Christ and let your heart be changed. Anyway, Christ is the message. That's why I'm, I'm keep, I keep coming to this. It's, if you want to simplify this, this one chapter, people seek wisdom. But the wisdom of God is this. Christ is the message. Christ is the wisdom of God, him and him crucified. The problem remains the same. What is our message? What do we preach? What do we tell people? Don't say just Adi preaches. When you talk about, oh, to someone about God, you are preaching. Maybe not, you know, as elo I mean, you're not using Paul's eloquence or whatever, but you are counseling people, probably, hopefully from a biblical perspective, and basically you're giving a message. What is your message? Come to church and you'll be rich. Come to church and your problems will go away. Have your problems gone away when you became a Christian? For some have multiplied actually. What happened? Why do we still believe in Christ? Why do we still go to come to church? Why do we still belong to the body of Christ even though 
were not like shiny happy people. It's because somebody carries that burden with us. It is because we can have hope and joy in the midst of all the trials. It means I can cry my heart out and still not despair. It means I can, I can suffer and not lose hope. That is because the message is not human success. The message is not health. The message is not wealth. The message is not prosperity, whatever you want to call it. The message is Christ. You know, when you focus your eyes on things above, these things here, they truly dim out and lose importance. The problem is, this is what we mostly focus our cars, our houses, our cottages, our, our boats, our vacations, our staycations, or whatever. I'm going to take one next week. But Christ is the message. Do we tailor our message to fit the cultural expectation around us? How do we define success? If I preach today the gospel here and say, Christ is the solution, and I say even Muhammad is not the solution, and how the church walks out on me. Have I failed? Maybe I could be wiser. I could be smarter. I could be use better words. I don't know. But in the end, have I failed if I point people to Christ and they reject me and reject him? Let me bring you some new good news. John 3, John, not 316, 1633. A promise God made to all of us. In the, the promise is this, in the world, you will have tribulations. I'm not going to finish it. I'm going to stay with this part of the promise. In the world, you will have tribulations. We don't claim this, but it's true. But in the midst of, of those tribulations, the message stays the same. Christ is our message. He does finish that verse, by the way. I'm going to be hanging. But, okay. In the world you have tribulation, but rejoice or be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It's not just Paul who is called to preach and proclaim. It is anyone that is in Christ. We are his ambassadors. Make a note if you want, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 20 and 21. You are his ambassadors. When you go on the plane to, what's it called, uh, Australia, you know, Pray for the person to the other side than Mike or Margie. And may you be an ambassador or to the flight attendant or the, what's the fancy word now? Or that is a fancy word, flight attendant. Okay. Who knows? Maybe your smile, maybe the gift to that person that can ask you, what's, what's, what's wrong with you? You know, by the way, you know, I learned a good lesson uh, from, uh, from school, actually preparing for school. Um, you know, you know how he just leads with questions? He teaches with questions. He, you know, I learned the best question, question in counseling that can open up all the doors. And the question is this, what is wrong with you? Anyway, that was a joke. Don't use it. Don't quote me on this one. Okay, sorry. So Mike and Margie, you are ambassadors. Jesse, you are an ambassador. Rudy, on a radio, when you get on your thingy and you preach, not preach, sorry, when you talk to people on radio, you are an ambassador, Brother Rudy. And your message is what? One word. Christ. Exactly. And this is what we need to do. And let me give you this definition I, I, I copied and I wouldn't say stole. I learned. Okay. I learned and retained from my old days in Campus Crusade for Christ. And this is what they said back then in Romania. To have a message is this. It is to take initiative to boldly proclaim Christ, Jesus, and him crucified. Two words here. To take the initiative. Do it. Don't find excuses. Take initiative and boldly find the courage in Christ to proclaim the one message, Christ and him crucified. But two more things. Do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving the results in the hand of God. You do not change people's hearts. You have a message and there is a mystery that Christ is that message. Don't worry about you changing people's hearts. The Spirit of God does it. You just preach the message. And make sure your life lines up with that message. If you're an obnoxious, proud person and you say that message, you'll be a stain. 
on the, what you call this in English? The cheek? The, the, yeah, of, of Christ. Like we, we learned this last week, be humble, shun pride, not shun, what's the word? Uh, reject pride and preach the message. Christ is the message. Take the initiative to boldly proclaim Christ Jesus and him crucified in the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving the results in the hand of God. And close to my, <laughs> getting close to my end of my notes, it is foolish to rely on charisma or the gift of gab. That None of those save people. So I pray that you rely upon the Holy Spirit and his power as you proclaim the one message, which is Christ. To save people is not to be persuasive in speaking. It is to rely upon the Spirit-given power that we all have. It is to experience that work of Christ in us as his servants when we proclaim Christ in our weakness, not in our strength, not in our ability, but in our weakness. Just like Zechariah said, I think it's on the screen. Why is that there and I didn't use it? Okay, let me go back to this because it's important. <sighs> let me ask this question. I forgot to click. Do we tailor our message to fit our culture expectation? Do numbers matter? If numbers are our goal, what's on the screen, Rudy? That was a joke, sorry. That was a joke. If numbers are our goal, Christ becomes an impediment. We are driven to move the scandal aside so we can get numbers in. If numbers become our goal, Christ becomes the impediment. Don't go there. You have one message, and that is Christ Jesus. My message will be Christ and him crucified. I had all that stuff on the screen. I forgot to click. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, rely not on fancy methods, but on the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we catch up again. Not by might, not, nor by power, but my, by spirit. By my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And Zechariah 6, 4, 4, 6. You know, don't exalt yourself. Don't exalt you, because when you do that, you cannot exalt Christ at the same time. Lift him up in his power, and you'll see miracles. Finally, praise God for enabling us to understand his wisdom through the Spirit. Everyone wants to be smart or wise, but true wisdom comes from God and God alone by his Holy Spirit. The difference between a believer and an unbeliever is not smarts. It's not one is smart and the other one is not. The difference is that one has the Spirit. If we do not have the Spirit, we'll be just like the other unbelievers and reject, God, reject God's wisdom of a crucified Messiah. There is no reason for us to celebrate our own wisdom. We got every single reason to celebrate God's imparted wisdom that, comes, that came to us. Ask God to fill you up with his wisdom and he shall give it to you because he promised it. James 1.5. We may not have, have all the answers. If you think wisdom is to have all the answers, it's not. We don't have all the answers. But, you know, we can ask smart questions. When someone says, you know, we came from the monkeys. I'm not going to go too deep into this one. But ask this question. Define for me irreducible complexity. How come some systems, like the cell of human body, is so complex that if one, more, one thing is, is not there, everything dies? How can that evolve when it's, it's complex in a way that cannot be reduced? irreducible complexity. Or how come our DNA that you passed to, to Zach, Pastor Joe, is faulty with probably two or three mistakes than more than you have gotten from your father. And Zach will pass down to his kids his DNA plus two or three mistakes or more. That's called genetic entropy. It, it flies in the face of anything called evolution. Because we, we as humans, we do not evolve. We in, involve, is, give me the word, involve, Devolve, sorry, devolve. We're, we're in a dev, dev, okay, we're getting worse. By the generation, genetically, we are getting worse. We're not evolving. We're losing inf genetic information. We're getting worse. What does that lead to? Way, way back then, there was a perfect man. Who made that? We can ask good questions. We don't have all the answers. We can ask good questions. So in evangelism, 
Don't rely upon smarts. Training is good, Pastor, Pastor Peter. Amazing training. Thank you for the church. But more important, sorry to say this. I'm not, I'm not sorry. What am I sorry? I'm not sorry. But more important is to have the power of the Holy Spirit and the clarity of the message. Rely upon God's wisdom. I know Pastor Peter does this. I'm not, <laughs> but you know, if I say sorry too much, I'm probably too Canadian at this point. Questions at the end. Actually, I wrote this words. question at the end. The quest for message and mystery is in everybody's life. We all want to have a message and we all kind of have this craving for the mystery. Do you want to be wise? May, do you want to be wise or just smart? Wise or smart or both? Probably both would be best of the both, both worlds, you know? Or whose power to rely when we want to convince someone, our skill or God's spirit? May we never let the desire to succeed or the need to be approved push us to compromise our message or seek power and or wisdom elsewhere but in God. Who are you? Are you a natural man seeking wisdom but not seeing God? Or are you a spiritual man or woman, person? If you do seek wisdom, seek no more. Just surrender to Christ, to the one that can forgive, redeem, and restore. And in that process, you get wisdom too, thrown in as a double deal. Let's pray.